Well, good evening and welcome to our evening service uh, here at Parker Bible Church. Uh, this is rather a uh, unique service tonight as it is our deacon ordination service for Scott Humphrey and Chris Kaler. And you will hear more about these two men um, here in a few moments. But tonight as we begin, we want to uh, focus our minds on leadership in the church. And um, we want to look, to do that, we want to look at the qualifications for both elders and deacons as found in 1 Timothy chapter 3. So if you have a copy of scripture, please turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 1 through 13. And if you would, please stand in honor of the reading of God's word. It is a trustworthy statement, if any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer, then, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited or fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil." Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but hold to the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own household. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standard and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we're just thankful for this great opportunity to recognize Scott and Chris this evening as deacons in the church. Uh, we thank you for their desire to serve, and we pray for wisdom for them. And we pray for all of our leaders, uh, both deacons and elders, that as we serve, we would be able to bring glory to your name, that you would be pleased with our service, and may we give you the praise. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, just a reminder of how we got to this point, and very quickly uh, to remind you that the pro we have a process here for appointing both elders and deacons, and the process is a little different for deacons than it is for elders, but you hopefully will remember that uh, a while back, it's now been almost two years ago because of COVID, uh, but uh, uh, we had nominations. We ask you to nominate men who were biblically qualified according to uh, what was just read, the, the standards given in scripture, and those men who are already faithfully serving. And then we went from that list of nominations and we've uh, come down to identify these two men that uh, now have been through a period of time, a time of testing, and uh, now we're ready to officially say that we have confidence in these men, that they're godly men, that they're qualified men, and they're ready to serve this body of believers as deacons. And so that's what we've come to do tonight, is to officially install them as deacons. And then the process for elders is a little different, but it, both of these processes um, involve periods of time so that we can uh, make sure the men are qualified and ready to serve in this capacity. So we welcome these men tonight. Well, why don't we stand once again as we continue to lift our voices 
in praise tonight. Let's sing together. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love. Good evening. Uh, this is a great night for a lot of reasons, but one of, one of them is the Lord has blessed this church body with some amazing people, a lot of amazing people that are willing to serve above and beyond the call. They don't need positions. They don't need titles. They don't need any of that. They just serve the Lord. And tonight... I'm going to do a short introduction of the two men um, that are going through the ordination process, and they um, exemplify um, that very thing, and um, they're great guys and hard workers, and they love the Lord. Before I do that, I thought it might be helpful for the, the other deacons, the active deacons, if we get them to maybe stand up real quick, and then we want you to know who they are. We want you to be able to find them if you have things that you uh, need to talk about or uh, issues that um, 
they can help you with. So I'll have them um, stand up quickly and sit down, then we'll get on with um, Scott and Chris. So the other men that are serving uh, actively as deacons now are Tim Morris, Charlie Parkinson, Stan Burek. And we have one that has been faithful to the very end, our brother Gail Pipkin, who is not here tonight. And if you've been around this church very long, you know that that is a man that has served this church and the Lord faithfully for many, many years. We're going to miss him. We're praying. And we're uh, tonight, uh, Tim graciously um, agreed to lead the deacons. But he had one comment. He said, but only till Gail gets back. And he's coming back. <laughs> so uh, we, we, but I just, um, I just, we, we should just really appreciate these guys for serving, right? So. Okay, so tonight, um, we also want you to be able to identify families and wives. Uh, so, Kalers, can you stand up? We'd like to make this as uncomfortable as possible. <laughs> um, so, uh, I just want to give you a little bit of background. Uh, many of you, most of you probably know them, but um, it's just interesting hearing their story a little bit. They've been attending PBC since the fall of 2012. Uh, Chris was raised in a Lutheran church and didn't really accept the Lord, hadn't really felt like he'd accepted the Lord. Um, but just uh, a month after starting to attend PBC, um, he professed Christ and the Lord saved him. And another interesting fact that's really cool is that April, the entire Kaler family was baptized in the same service. So that was really a cool deal. Uh, and then I asked them, we see you around, but what have you, uh, what have you been doing to, do, to serve? And I'm gonna have to shorten both of these lists because it would take a while, but here are, here are some highlights for Chris Kaler. Um, he started out uh, volunteering and helping Stan uh, with various things, primarily the IT, computers, phones, internet, um, but also doing some building maintenance, lighting, and other things. When Pastor Michael arrived, he wanted to establish live streaming, and he asked me to set that up and manage it. That was timely, wasn't it, with what we've gone through? We didn't know about COVID before that happened, but the Lord, you know, going ahead of us, um, like he does, provided that, and we were really glad that Chris was here. Um, to help set that up and keep it going. Um, he's also helped with VBS. Uh, he supported Keith and Gail on work days and uh, doing things maintenance wise on the office buildings. Um, he supports Kale uh, by maintaining the church email distribution lists and he supports Truth Trackers uh, on Grand Prix Saturday. He's in the choir and he's ushered in the past. And other than that, he's washed every car in the parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> He does a great job, and, he, and both, of these, both of these men are amazing when you see them behind the scenes because some, some task comes up, something that needs to be done, and both of these men are like the first guys to say, I'll help, I'll do it, what can I do? Um, and I'm telling you, is that not a huge blessing? That's a huge blessing, so that's the Kalers. You can sit down. Okay, the next family to embarrass is the Humphreys. Stand on up. They're the first row, most of it. Okay. Um, Scott came to know and trust the Lord at the age of 35. That was in uh, 1913. Oh, oh sorry. I, I read that wrong. 2009. Okay. Uh, they started, it, the family started attending PBC November of 2014, and they became members of the church in spring of 2015. Um, Scott is a very interesting guy, a man of uh, a lot of talents and uh, willingness to work. He served in these areas at PBC, children's Sunday, he was a children's Sunday school teacher, um, grades three through six, and more, more recently grades three and four. He's ushered. 
Um, he does offering counting. He was Judas Iscariot in the Living Last Supper. <laughs> that was that was just right on the edge of disqualification. <laughs> but we we overlooked it since it was a play. Okay. Um, He's a volunteer leader for church work days. Um, he's the van driver when needed. He's a volunteer for the youth winter camp. And uh, he's also a Sunday night chair stacking, rearranger, and expert. <laughs> so um, they have three kids, Austin, Tyler, and Jessica. I forgot to introduce your kids. <laughs> they stood up here. Um, but anyway, um, Scott and Chris do yeoman's work for the Lord. And they don't do it for praise, and they don't do it for, um, you know, selfish ambition. They do it because they love Jesus, and they want his church to be the best it can be, and they want to offer themselves and their skills any way they can. So these are the two men and their families that we um, are going through the process with tonight, and I think we should give them a big hand. Well, we can call this an ordination or an installment service in the sense that we are affirming that these men are qualified to serve. They are men this body of believers wishes to appoint as deacons in this particular church. And we have gone through this process of appointment that has taken more than a year. And now we come to this point tonight. Men who are scripturally qualified to serve in this way and are willing to do the work that is required are a tremendous blessing to any church. And we are truly enriched by the service of these men and their wives in this body of believers. We are blessed by the men who are already serving as well as these new deacons. But before we officially install these men tonight to serve in this capacity, I think it's good to go back and review the biblical role of deacons. And we need to be reminded periodically of what the Bible has to say about this important office, and we need to make sure we're following what the Scripture says. As we see in Scripture, there are two and only two scriptural officers in the church. There are the elders, which are also referred to in scripture as pastors, overseers, bishops, or shepherds. And then there are the deacons. But there is a great deal of misunderstanding generally in the church today concerning the roles of both of these scriptural officers. So I want to just quickly tonight uh, begin by looking at some misconceptions of the role of deacon. There are a number of common misconceptions held by many in the church today about the proper New Testament role of deacons. And these misconceptions have caused, I believe, a distortion of God's plan for the church. For example... Many churches have made the deacons a ruling body in the church. The deacons pretty much run things in many churches, especially in the Deep South. Folks, that is not the biblical model. Deacons are not rulers, nor are they overseers. God has given that responsibility to the elders. The New Testament word for deacon is the Greek word for servant. In fact, sometimes that word diakonos is simply translated servant in the New Testament and is used in a general sense for someone who serves the church. I believe that it is used that way concerning Phoebe in Romans chapter 16, verse 1. Phoebe was a servant of the church, not a deaconess. The deacons are to be 
special servants in the body of Christ. They are responsible for the benevolence ministry of the church and other ministries that are oriented around serving the needs of the body. Again, they are not overseers. Even more disturbing than this is the fact that in some churches, deacons are really placed in a position of competition with the elders as, as kind of a system of checks and balances, kind of like two houses of Congress. Some churches think they need to have a deacon board in case the elder board gets out of line. And so they have it set up where the deacons serve as equal in authority with the elders so they can hold the elders accountable. Well, certainly the elders need to be held accountable. And certainly the church needs to make sure the elders don't get out of line. But that is not the biblical role for deacons to do that. There are scriptural principles for dealing with when the elders get out of line, but that's another sermon altogether. The fact is that biblically, deacons are to be under the authority and oversight of the elders. And if you study the New Testament, you will see there are a couple times, like on the island of Crete, in Titus 1.5, where there were elders without deacons, but there's never an occasion where there are deacons without elders. Why is that? Because the deacons come under the authority and leadership of the elders. And this is one of the reasons why we made sure in this church that we had elders in place before we ever appointed any deacons. So to summarize this point, deacons are not and never have been biblically a board of directors in the church. This is no doubt the number one misconception concerning the role of deacons. But there are some other misconceptions as well. Other churches have the idea that deacons are simply glorified building managers. Some churches think that the deacons are around in case there's a problem with the plumbing or in case the roof leaks. They're seen as building managers or glorified church janitors or sanctified groundskeepers. But folks, that is not the proper role for deacons either. Oh, they may at times be involved in some of that type of service, but that is, the, that is not the main focus of their role in the New Testament. Similar to that, some churches have the view that the deacons are the church's financial officers. And they think the deacons are responsible for paying the bills and managing the church's books. But that's not the biblical model either. Other churches think that the deacons are su supposed to do everything in the church that needs to be done. Whatever it is that needs to be done, they call the deacons and say, come do this or come take care of that. That's not it either. So we see, first of all, there are many misconceptions of what New Testament deacons are supposed to do. And many churches, I believe, have gone beyond the bounds of what the Scripture teaches. And many churches have given too much authority to deacons, and others have distorted their proper roles in the church. So what is the proper New Testament role for deacons? Let's look secondly at a model for the role of deacons. In a nutshell... In the words of Alexander Strauch, deacons are to be involved in a compassionate ministry of caring for the poor and needy. Strauch goes on to say the deacon's ministry is one that no Christ-centered New Testament church can ever afford to neglect. Christians today must 
understand the absolute necessity for and vital importance of New Testament deacons to the local church so that the needy, poor, and suffering of our churches are cared for in a thorough Christian manner. This is a matter that is very dear to the heart of God. And this is the proper New Testament role for deacons. Now we see this pattern given for us in Scripture in the book of Acts. In fact, in Acts chapter 6. So turn with me in your Bible to Acts chapter 6. And we're going to see the role of the deacons. In fact, let's go ahead and stand again. You've been sitting for a while. Go ahead and stand and let's read this, beginning in verse 1 of Acts chapter 6. Now, this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will divert, devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, uh, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. And I believe we need to include verse 7 as well. As a result of this, the word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Go ahead and be seated. <clears throat> now, most of you are probably familiar with this passage of Scripture. I believe in a practical sense, these were the first deacons of the New Testament era. And some have argued that these were not referred to as deacons, which is true. But even though this office may not have been fully developed at this time to the place where these men were formally recognized as deacons, the role that they fulfilled in the church at Jerusalem is the same role as was later recognized of New Testament deacons. And by the time Paul wrote 1 Timothy, deacons were clearly recognized as scriptural officers in the church. When Paul greeted the Philippian church in Philippians 1.1, he said, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons. Acts chapter 6 is very Important in regard to not only the role of deacons, but also the role of elders. It tells us what the priorities are to be for the deacons, but it also tells us what the priorities are to be for the elders. In fact, it is impossible for us to get a proper understanding of the role of deacons without also understanding the proper role of elders. And this passage emphasizes the priority of the word and prayer for the elders and the priority of caring for the poor and needy for the deacons. There are only two passages in Scripture where the title deacon appears in the New Testament. And in both of those passages, there is a close association with the elders. Those passages are Philippians 1.1 and 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13. 
The role of New Testament deacon is intimately tied with the God-given priorities for elders. In Acts 6, we see the priorities for elders are the ministry of the word and prayer. And the role for deacons is essentially tied to freeing up the elders to be able to continue with those priorities. The apostles who represent the forerunners of the elders said it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. They said in verse 4, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And as Alex Strauch points out, the apostles constituted the first official leadership body of the, the first Christian congregation. The 12, as Luke calls them, were the church's first body of overseers or shepherds. In the beginning, the apostles were not only teaching the word of God, but they were also taking care of the funds which were going to take care of the needy in the church. And every Friday in the early church, they would take up an offering for the widows called the kappa offering. And that would be used to supply food for those who had no husbands to care for them. And it got to the place where the apostles could no longer handle all of those responsibilities. And the church was growing rapidly and the benevolence needs of the body was becoming so overwhelming that the apostles could not keep up with this needed area of service. In addition to that, there was some strife that was developing among the widows that were be, being cared for. And there was a problem between the Jewish widows and the Hellenistic widows. This, by the way, was one of the first tests of brotherly love in the early church. And the elders knew that if they devoted all their time feeding these people physically, it would keep them from their greater priority of feeding the people spiritually with the word of God. So we know what they did. <clears throat> the deacon ministry was birthed out of this need. And the apostles asked the congregation to choose seven men who could take over this responsibility so that they could continue to fulfill their God-given responsibility in the church. And although the formal qualifications for deacons were not given until later, they were instructed to choose men who exhibited three things. First of all, they were to be men who were of good reputation. That is, they were to be men who were above reproach as far as their godly lifestyle. Secondly, they were to choose men who were obviously full of the Spirit. And that is saying really the same thing as men who are controlled by the Spirit, which is essentially another way of saying they are walking in obedience and submission to the Spirit of God. Thirdly, they were to choose men who exhibited godly wisdom. These men were going to be given a very important responsibility in the church, so they needed to be wise. In fact, the elders have a God-given priority of focus on prayer and the ministry of the word, but that does not in any way minimize the importance of the ministry to the poor and needy in the congregation. The deacon's role is a very important role, and that's why the Bible gives high standards for both of these offices. The role of the deacon is no less important, even though it's a different role with a different level of authority. In the first century, the specific need of the Hellenistic or the Greek-speaking Jews was being neglected. 
In our day, it might be assisting those who have lost their jobs, but it's still very important. Where are deacons to be ministering in the body? To those who are hurting, to those who are in crisis, to those who are sick, to those who are needy in any way. And this benevolence aspect of the ministry is one that is very important in the church. There are service and ministry needs in the body that the elders may not be able to meet without the help of the deacons. Now, the problem of helping needy people was so common in the first century that it was almost a pattern that was quickly established in the church. It was established here in Acts chapter 6, but it was then copied by all the other churches. And by 62 AD, the office of deacon was a recognized position with an official title in at least two of the churches that were established by Paul. Church history reveals that deacons were an intrinsic part of every church throughout the Roman Empire, even during the earliest days of the second century. <clears throat> so we see here in Acts 6 a clear model for the role of the New Testament deacon. And very quickly, number three, I want to give you a measure for the role of deacons. By the time Paul wrote 1 Timothy in about 63 AD, the two offices of elder and deacon had become firmly established. And as you look at the list of qualifications we read earlier in 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13, there are a couple of things that are conspicuously absent from the deacon's list of requirements as opposed to the requirements of elders. The first major difference is that the elders have to be able to teach while the deacons do not have this requirement. Titus 1 says the elders must be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. There is no such requirement for deacons. Now this doesn't mean that a deacon cannot be a teacher, but he's not required to be able to teach. Another thing to note <clears throat> is that the scripture says in places like Acts 20:28 20, and Philippians 1:1 1, 1, that the elders are given the responsibility of spiritual oversight of the flock, but nowhere in Scripture does it ever say that deacons are to exercise spiritual oversight. So the role of the deacon does not include that of teaching or official church supervision. But beyond these two primary differences, we need to note that the character qualifications for both are essentially the same. Some churches think that the role of deacons is not as important as the role of elder. Therefore, the qualifications don't have to be as high for deacons. I mean, you know, if deacons are merely seen as glorified building custodians, then what difference does their character make? But that is wrong to think that way. In fact, it is a very common mistake, and it can have a drastic negative impact in the church. So first of all, we need to understand that the role of the deacon is no less important than that of the elder. <clears throat> Although there's a difference in function and authority, there's no difference in value to the body of Christ the work of the deacon is essential. By the way, this is very similar to <clears throat> the difference in function and authority in a marriage. There's absolutely no, absolutely no difference in value. One is not better than the other, or more important than the other, but there are different God-given roles and functions and responsibilities for the husband and for the wife. And of course, that's clearly spelled out in Ephesians 5. So because there's no difference in the importance of these two offices, 
we must be very careful not to fall into the trap of thinking that the qualifications for deacons can be any less than that of an elder, with the only exception of not having the requirement to be able to teach or to exercise oversight. So we have a measure for the role of the deacon as compared to that of the elder. And lastly tonight, I just want you to see the manifestation of the role of deacons. <clears throat> what will be the result when the deacons are fulfilling their God-given role and the elders are fulfilling their God-given role? The result is that the church will continue to prosper and grow. That's the result. Look at Acts 7, uh, 6, 7 again. The word of God kept on spreading <clears throat> and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. This is what happens, folks, when we do it God's way. God blesses and the church prospers and the number of disciples continues to increase and people come to know Christ as the needs are being met and strife is being dealt with biblically in the church. This is the blessing of having godly deacons. We're going to ask Pastor Michael to come at this time and issue a charge. This is a charge to our new deacons, so I'm going to ask uh, Scott and Chris if you would both please stand. Do you commit to serve the, this body of believers in a way that honors Christ and enhances the work of the church? Do you commit to follow Christ as the Lord of the church? And do you, in the presence of this congregation, accept the responsibility of the office of deacon and to the best of your ability to fulfill your biblical role as such? Right, great. You may be seated. Now, congregation, this charge is to you. So I would ask the congregation to stand, if you would, for just a moment, please. Do you, the members of this congregation, acknowledge these men as deacons in the church? Do you promise to pray for them and support them and encourage them in their work, and to cooperate with them in the fulfillment of the mission of this church? If so, would you indicate by saying, Amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, at this time, let me ask our deacon candidates, if you will, to uh, come and kneel here in the altar. And uh, let me just invite all of our ordained men, uh, all ordained men that would like to come. At this time, we're going to have the laying on of hands. This is what is given in Scripture. And so we're going to come and gather around these men and lay hands on them and then have a special time of prayer for them. Heavenly Father, it's my privilege to come and pray specifically for my brother Scott Humphrey. Father, we're so grateful for this time that we see him set apart and called out and appointed by this congregation to serve them as deacon. Father, I'm so grateful for um, our friendship, 
that he's my brother in Christ. I'm grateful for the time we've already spent over uh, nearly two years now serving together as deacons. And uh, I pray for your great blessing on Scott. I thank you for his willingness to serve in this way, for his great love for you. I thank you for Heather, their family, the children. I thank you for the way that we see them all serving. They're a vital part of this body. I'm so grateful for his example to all of faithful service. And Father, I pray that you would give him great wisdom. I pray you'd give him great confidence in the faith as he serves. And I pray that you would um, cause this body of believers to flourish because of uh, Scott's ministry as deacon alongside of the rest of us. And uh, we're just so grateful for him. I pray your great blessing for him. His own walk with you would just be um, blessed and blessed. And you would, and, and his um, daily relationship with you uh, would be all that you want for him. And, and we praise you and thank you for this time where we set him apart as deacon. In Christ's name. And precious Father, I come before you to lift up my brother Chris. I thank you for leading this congregation to identify him as a, as a deacon candidate. Brother Chris has been serving long before he was even asked to be a deacon. He voluntarily helped in any way he could whenever he was asked. And I would just pray that you would continue to give him an extra measure of discernment, wisdom, and compassion as uh, he fulfills his role as deacon here. And uh, we ask the blessing upon his whole family as it is a family affair when a deacon is chosen. And again, I, I give you the thanks for uh, showing this body uh, what what we need to look for in a possible deacon. And we ask that both these candidates, that it would glorify you and help build your body here in Parker. And we ask all in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Our Father, we are grateful for these men who are willing to serve your church. And Lord, we thank you for their heart that uh, they so obviously love you and desire to please you. And Lord, we're thankful for their families. We're thankful for uh, just what we see in their lives, that they are examples of what it means to follow Christ. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for their heart of service, that they're willing to invest their time and to give uh, of themselves and to do what is necessary to meet the needs of this body of believers. Lord, we thank you that they are wise men. And Lord, we pray that you would help them to apply that wisdom to the particular needs of this congregation. <clears throat> and Lord, we pray that as a result of their willingness to serve you, that the church would continue to grow and prosper. And Lord, that uh, there would be many who would come to know Christ. And Lord, we thank you that you've given us your pattern in your word of how business is to be conducted in your church. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us as we seek to follow that and be faithful to you in that regard. And so tonight, as we have this official time of setting apart these two men for this special role of service, Lord, we pray that your hand of blessing would be upon them, <clears throat> on their families, and upon this church body. And we thank you for this privilege. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You men can go back to your seats. I have the honor of presenting the certificate of ordination tonight to these two gentlemen. Uh, on a personal note, I just wanted to uh, thank these 
two men and their families. Uh, when I was having my health issues, uh, the compassion of the Humphrey family was high, high on my list. And I appreciate that. And then Chris, your, your laughter, you can hear it through the building. And I, you've been an encouragement to me because of your positive attitude through, through circumstances and just, you know, your example. Then the, the children, you know, there's five kids here that have served willingly. Bob mentioned that earlier, what the men are doing. Tim mentioned uh, the service of, uh, of uh, all these uh, young people. And that's an example uh, to others. Uh, me, personally, being involved in education, all the years I've been involved in education, I've really appreciated what I've seen in these young people uh, and their service and their willing service. So I'd like to call Chris and his family up here, please. We got this nifty certificate of ordination to give to them. But I just want them to turn around and see the congregation that they're serving. And I just appreciate you all. Let's, uh, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and then Scott and your family, please. <clears throat> see, Bob, I'm not embarrassing him. <laughs> Bob said, I'm going to embarrass him. But no, how could I embarrass him? Nifty haircut, Austin. No. <laughs> Um, I just want to thank you guys again, both families. But Scott, appreciate your, your leadership. And um, for two years, they've been serving. They hit the ground running two years ago, and I've appreciated that. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> so, Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for... Oh, Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, there's nothing that compares to the way you sacrificed your son so that we can have that free gift of salvation. So, Lord, we thank you for who you are and for what you've done. We thank you for this body of believers that you've assembled. We thank you for the elders that are leading this church faithfully. We thank you for the deacons that are serving the body. We thank you for these two men and their families that are willing to to come and, and join us. But Lord, we're reminded that, again, as we go through the Bible, that we're all in charge of serving, that that's something you put on all of us. So I pray for the rest of the body that you continue to serve the way you have been serving. I pray that you help us as deacons to continue to serve in a way that would just be pleasing to you, that would glorify you in everything we do. We love you, Lord. Again, we thank you for this great evening. And it's in your son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Uh